was um, talking with our production director, Keith, right back here, uh, who's an amazing man of God and a good friend of mine. I said, Keith, we got to do that song, Great Are You, Lord, because I love the part where it just talks about the breath inside of us. Because I don't know if you realize this or not, but when you think about what could I, and we come on a, on, a, on a weekend, and you think, what could I possibly give back to God that God doesn't already have? And really, that's a daunting question because the answer is really nothing. Like, I mean, this is the creator of the universe. Like, what in the world do I have that he doesn't have except for my praise? Did you know that your worship back to God is the only thing that God can't do for himself? It's why the scriptures say that if you don't worship me, I'll let the rocks cry out. In other words, God's going to get glory somewhere. It might as well just be from us. So sometimes when you have nothing else to give back to God, just the breath in your lungs is the greatest thing anyways. Like a, like a child to their father or their mother. That's all God wants from you. So Father, is, as kids coming back to their parents, we come back to you. Lord, I love that you're a heavenly father with open arms, no matter where we've been, what we've done. God, I know that in a room this size, there are some of us that are kind of weirded out right now because we don't really have a relationship with you and we don't really know what we believe about you. And here's all these people like actually singing and smiling like they believe what they're saying. And I just pray, God, today, no matter where we're at on the spectrum of spirituality or faith, God, that we realize that you are a custom God. And this isn't one size fits all, that you meet us right where we're at and you love us enough not to keep us there. So God, move us all, whether it's the first step towards you or I've been walking with you for a while. And Father, today we just give you back the breath that you breathed into us. And Jesus, I know, I know that that's what you want. Father, we're here. We love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, before you take a seat, we give somebody a high five and tell them happy birthday. Just say, yeah, happy birthday. <laughs> I saw some of you miss, like you hit the person. It's so dark in here. Oh, man. Well, hey, we are um, really glad to have you. Uh, my name is Nate. I get the privilege to serve as uh, one of the pastors. And man, today's just been a big celebration day all across three services. It's been amazing. And so you're, you're, if you're a first-time guest with us, it's a unique Sunday because we are celebrating our 15th year in ministry today. And when I was thinking about how did we want to sort of design this Sunday, there was no doubt in my mind that we had to bring back our founding pastor, Pastor Matt and Sarah McGue. So would y'all help me welcome them to the stage noon. Come on. Let's welcome Matt and Sarah today all the way from the ATL Hotlanta. We're glad to have you guys. You know, it's amazing. I've been very fortunate, very privileged uh, that LifePoint is the first and only church mm -hmm. I've ever pastored at. Yeah. So I didn't plant the church. I've been the lead pastor for uh, six years. But when LifePoint was eight months old, um, I jumped on board when they were meeting at a middle school cafetorium uh, at Southwest Middle School in, the, uh, in Steel Creek, part of Charlotte. You can see some of the pictures here of set up and tear down. And I just love this because Matt has always seen more in me than I see in myself. I just hope you have somebody in your life that sees more in you than you see in yourself. You need that. Next to my wife, Matt and Sarah have been my greatest cheerleaders, and they continue to cheer us on into this next 15 years. So, man, we're honored to have you guys today. Uh, I just had to ask you a couple questions. Matt, I'll start with you. Um, when you think about today, 15 years ago, right. y'all were driving up to the middle school that day for the yes. very first Sunday. Right. What was it like? Give us some of the thoughts in your head as you guys went from you know meeting in a living room with a vision on a napkin yes. to this cafeteria for the grand launch of LifePoint Church. What were you hoping for? Yeah, you know, like our first Sunday, getting the middle school ready, our first question was, God, please let someone show up. You know, right, right, you open the right. door for the first time, you really hope. You no and, idea. and we saw God do it. We saw God answer the prayers and the vision that he'd given us for that Steel Creek community, a very diverse community. And we saw people of all different backgrounds, social, economically, ethnically. It was just a beautiful, even uh, generationally, it was just a beautiful beginning of this church 15 years ago. And so it's just a thrill to see God answer those prayers. I love it. And I love your faithfulness. You know, they left a thriving ministry in Ohio, packed up their minivan with their two boys, right. drove down to the Carolinas, and they did this thing called church planting, which if you don't know this, like early 2000s, that wasn't cool. Like people weren't doing that. It wasn't trendy like it is today. They were like starting something and people are going, why would you leave something right. successful? I bet yeah. you got a lot of that. Sure. to go to this and start uh, this church that probably statistically won't make it past year three. True. And here we are today. So Sarah, as you now um, look back at the last 15 years, what excites you the most just to see all that God has done? Oh, 
Well, I do stalk everything that like what yeah. does on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all that. So, but I think what encouraged me the most is probably the baptisms yeah. and just seeing the film right. that you guys do after um, after everyone that you put on there, and it just it just gets to my soul that every you know. I'm not going to cry, <laughs> but um, just seeing the people who maybe never would have stepped into the doors of a church, um, and so that just encourages me so much. Yeah. Fifteen years later, I think, oh my gosh, that's a long time that we've been doing this, but, um, and then you and um, Emily, just mm -hmm. watching you guys grow from right. before marriage getting through marriage, kids, and, and now to see you, how you're just blowing the doors off of everything. Yeah, so that's encouraging. It's really cool. I know. I, w I was a kid. I was 21 years old when I right. met you guys. And right. I, had the, the, I had the frosted tips and the earrings. Yep. Like, you were like, I don't know if you should be in a boy band or prison <laughs> or both. Right. But whatever reason, you gave me opportunities that I probably didn't deserve. But right. I love that you walked me through it and taught me what leadership looked like. And um, it's, been, it's been amazing. So, yeah. Matt, I'll give you the final word here. Uh, sure. As you now... You know, we're focusing on 15 more. Yep. When you think about the next 15 right. years as our founding pastor, the both of you had that had this original vision. What's a word of encouragement? What do we need to be focused on? Mm. What would you say? Yeah, you know, uh, glorifying God overall. But LifePoint was started with great faith yeah. and with audacious prayers. We believed in, still do, in a big God that can answer big prayers. So don't be praying small prayers to a big God. So, so I just say keep that up. Pray big, dream big, and Nate's a great vision caster and dreamer for the Lord and for the kingdom. So keep it up, man. I can't wait to see what God's going to do 15 next. Wow, man, 15 me too. More. Well, help me thank Matt and Sarah again. Matt's getting ready to preach week two of our series, 15 more, so you get to hear from him. But before Matt comes back out, I want you to see a happy birthday video from some of you. Thanks for coming. most is that when we walk in we feel like we're at home and that it holds all walks of life. <laughs> Happy birthday, birthday LifePoint. Life Point. And I like about Life Group that we get to um, learn more about God. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday LifePoint. Life we love LifePoint because it's just like a family. Seeing everybody, all our friends and everything and uh, we just want to wish LifePoint a happy birthday and many more. Happy birthday. Happy birthday LifePoint. This ministry has just been phenomenal. We are, feels like family. We have enjoyed every aspect from the first um, day that we came. And we would just like to say all together, Happy, Happy birthday, LifePoint! Life what we love most about LifePoint is the message that we hear every week and the way that we feel when we leave. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. LifePoint's like a family to us. Uh, they've uh, always been there and very supportive and, uh, and it just just a happy place to be. What about you, Grace? Where you live? My favorite part about Life Point is when I get to ranger and also when I get to come in early and help set up everything. I really enjoy that. What brought us to Life Point uh, about 12 years ago was they had a um, youth pastor with some sweet blonde tips and a big diamond earring. Uh, and we said we got to come back and check this place out. But in all seriousness, uh, just the fact that everybody is real and that you can be yourself and um, that uh, you know we're all in it together, and it's it's just a big a big family. So we're happy to be a part of uh, uh, of Life Point. Happy uh, 15th birthday! Happy 15th birthday, Life Point! Yeah, happy birthday, Life Point! Yes, 15 years. I got to tell you all what this means to me and my wife Sarah to be brought back all these 15 years later. Have the privilege to come here and. Pastor Nate invited me to come speak today. I'm just blown away at the grace and goodness of God. Man, seriously, this is honoring to me. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. My wife, we just want to honor you back for this opportunity. In fact, I thought, you know, coming here, I've got to look way deep back into my closet and see if I can find maybe some, an old shirt that I might have worn back in the early life point days. And I'm rocking it right here, right, right, right. It's got that silky thing that they used to print 15 years ago. And, uh, you know, it's got that shortcut like that, you know. It's like, this is one of the oldies but goodies. Come on. Someone said, keep wearing it. It'll come back, Matt. 
which that meant it's not in right now, right? So, uh, uh, yeah, I rarely wear it. It was way in the back of my closet, so I had to break it out just for nostalgia, you know, to preach. In fact, I was looking at some pictures that when Nate and I had that transition moment where I was passing the baton of leadership on to Nate to take the church forward, and God was calling us out to go plant a church in Mississippi. And so, man, I was looking at those old pictures, and I'm like, I was wearing this shirt. I really was. <laughs> I'm like, that is so crazy. So, man, God has been really good to us the last six and a half years since we've transitioned out of here, and we've been able to plant churches in Mississippi. Now we're in Atlanta planting churches. Our church there will be one-year-old coming up next month in October. In fact, our church family there this morning, yeah, it's awesome. In fact, our church family there this morning is going over to the new building we're getting into and cleaning it, getting it ready to move in so we can reach more people just like you guys are. So it's such a thrill to see what the kingdom of God is doing all around and especially here today on this 15th anniversary. So who is the GOAT? Maybe you've heard that word before, right? And uh, in fact, I think it was coined by Muhammad Ali, the great boxer back in the 60s and 70s. I'm the greatest of all times. You know, you remember Muhammad Ali? Maybe not. But uh, Muhammad Ali used to say that about himself. And then since then, it's kind of been a, a term that in athletics everybody uses. So what I'd like to do, I need your interaction to help me out here. I'm going to ask you on a particular sport, who's the GOAT, and you yell out who you think it is, all right? So who is the GOAT, the greatest of all times in the NFL? <laughs> it might have been Cam till he put on that weird looking like thing at the... At the end of the game, what was that? You know, the little Robin Hood, I don't know what it was. Anyway, um, no, uh, who is the GOAT of the NBA? Jordan! Oh, man. Some people, this is like church. We're having church in here. People are, hallelujah. And, and, yeah, praise LeBron, you know, and Jordan. And oh, my gosh, you guys get your feelings up in that stuff right there, man. Who is the greatest of all time in swimming? All right, that's kind of, everybody's like, who else is there? <laughs> you know, it's Michael Phelps. Yeah. Who is the greatest of all time in women's tennis? Serena. Serena, yeah, Serena's amazing, right? Right, cool. Who's the greatest of all time in golf? Tiger. Yeah, man, to see Tiger come back after such a hard season in his life and then win a big championship recently, wow, you know, that's so cool. Um, let's see, maybe there be one more, we're in the South. Who is the greatest of all time in cornhole? <laughs> Nobody's, I'm thinking we're in the South, everybody does cornhole down here, right? We even do it in Mississippi and Atlanta, right, all over the place. But man, I heard your other pastor, Chris Root, is like the greatest of all time in cornhole, right? No, no doubt, here, here, this is funny. One time I was flipping through ESPN channels, they have several, and there must have been this ESPN redneck or something, and all of a sudden there was, seriously, there was on a cornhole tournament that they had on ES, one of those little ESPN channels. I'm like, what? The greatest of all time? Yeah. I don't know what it is that you might think who's the greatest of all time, but I do know this. There is one man who was the GOAT, the greatest of all time, right? His name is Jesus. We're going to talk about him here in a minute. But what if I told you that Tom Brady, some people think he's the greatest of all time in the NFL. I know I might get some booze, whatever, but whatever you'd believe, because he's won so many championship rings and all that, Super Bowls. But what if I told you that Tom Brady went to his coach and said, Coach, from now on, before every game, I'm going to go in the trainer's room, and I'm going to get down, and I'm going to take the tape, and I'm going to tape the ankles and the smelly, gross feet of all of my offensive linemen because I want them to know I want to serve them as they protect me. People will go, are you kidding? Is that for real? Did that make the news? Like, is Tom Brady really humble himself? He's the GOAT. What if I said, LeBron James, since I'm on this stage and I want to honor your pastor, he's a big LeBron James fan. <laughs> I submit to you, brother. And so I will say that, let's say LeBron James, who's the GOAT of basketball, goes to uh, his coach and says this. Listen, coach, I've been doing this for a long time, and I want to start doing this. I'm going to go to the opponent's locker room before and after every home game, 
And I'm going to go in, and I'm going to disinfect and clean the entire bathroom, all the toilets, all the showers, before and after every game from now on. His coach would say, dude, what is wrong with you? We hire people to do that. You never have to even consider. Why would your mind even go there? Are you kidding me? Or what if Serena Williams, the go to women's tennis, would go to, uh, would go to her people and say, listen, from now on, when I'm not playing uh, uh, that, at that moment, I'm going to volunteer. I'm going to be, I'm going to be, I don't even know what to call this person. I'm going to be the person that runs the nets and picks up the ball and runs it back to the other side. She's like, from now on, every other match other than my own, I'll be doing that. I'm going to volunteer and serve the rest of, what? What if Tiger Woods said, listen, at the end of the day of all three days of the big PGA tournament, uh, I'm going to collect all the dirty laundry of all my fellow golfers, and I'm going to do laundry all night. I'm going to clean it, fold it. I'm going to present it to them in the morning, clean and fresh and ready to go. People would go, are you nuts? We, again, we got people to do that, man. Don't be, you are the goat. You don't need to do that. But what if I told you and imagine that the ultimate goat, the son of God, Jesus Christ, leaving heaven <laughs> coming to earth to wash dirty, stinky disciples' feet. And he knelt down and he began to wash his disciples' feet. That's crazy. People would say, but you're the Savior. You're God in the flesh, the incarnate. You, you, are, you are the Messiah. You're the rabbi. You don't do that. But Jesus did it. The ultimate goat lowered himself, humbled himself as a servant, And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But here's what Jesus had to say about himself in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. He said, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but came to be a servant, to serve others. There's not another religious leader from any other religion, whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, or any other faith or religion worldwide, has ever said these kind of words. But Jesus, the Son of God, who came as our Savior, said, I didn't come here from heaven to earth to be served, to be worshipped, to be or, or, you know, taken care of and pampered. I came to serve mankind and to give up his own life, a ransom for many. I want you to know that here at LifePoint, when people back 15 years ago started and launched this church in that middle school cafeteria, and it smelled like a middle school cafeteria, oh my gosh, there were crazy stories about that. But hey, it, it, when people came to our church back in those early days, people came to serve, not to be served. There was a DNA started from the birth of the church. What, like for instance, some of the, what blesses Sarah and I is that many from the original group from 15 years ago continue to worship here with you and serve with you. 15 years later in the same church, serving, serving, serving. Like Craig and Kathy Cox came to Life Point Church to serve, not to be served. And they were there our very first Sunday, 15 years ago this day. Isn't that crazy? I mean, the Thiele family came to serve, not to be served. Phil and Tammy Gaston came to this church to serve, not to be served. Ed and Tabitha Butler came to this church to serve and not to be served. I mean, I'd go on and on. Jeff and Nikki Boone came and started in our living room with this dream that we would serve our community and serve people that needed Jesus not to be served. There was an a integral, inaugural DNA that we are here to be Jesus. That means pick up our towel and serve. And so that, that's beautiful. Back in the day, just like eight months after we launched this church, that first summer, Nate and Emily Seaman came alongside of our youth ministry and started to be our intern with youth ministry. They came not to be served, but to be servants. And aren't you glad they did? <laughs> Give it up for your pastor and for Emily. Yeah. Wow. What a blessing, man. What a blessing. So we kind of walked through the scripture today briefly is because uh, we're coming back for the party, so we can't be, be here all day, right? So we'll come back later. We got to go home, eat a little bit of something, get a nap in, come on back for tonight, and watch the NFL, it'll be all good. Re- so we're going to read John chapter 13, talking about Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. Here's what the word of God says. It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave the world and to go to the Father. 
having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. <laughs> the ultimate goat lowered himself to be a servant. And what back then, 2,000 years ago, it was the worst of the worst job to be the front door person at any house or business that had to literally bow down with water, basin, and a towel and wash the nasty, stinky feet. And this is before pedicures and manicures and all that kind of cures, right? There was no cure at all back then. It was nasty, gross feet. And, and, and can you imagine... It's not like living here in Fort Mill and Charlotte where the streets are all paved nice, sidewalks are all good. It was dirt, it was dusty, it was nasty. And so people, everywhere they went, they had open-toed shoes. It wasn't, you know, closed-toed shoes. So your feet got gross anywhere you went during the day or evening, and especially when the rain came and the mud and all out nasty. So before you walked into the house, there would be usually a servant that would be there and usually that person was below minimum wage kind of person. It was a low end of the totem pole. Sometimes it was even immigrants from other countries that didn't even speak the same language. But, they knew, but people knew they could take advantage of that uh, social economically and just say, hey, be my servant. And I'll pay you a little bit, give you some food. And so that person had to lower themselves as almost a bond servant and, and, and clean people's feet. It was a disgusting, lowly job. Nobody wanted to do it. And when you did do it, you had to find a way to get out of it because it was so gross and disgusting. But every house and every business pretty much had that person. Now, what happened is when, when Jesus came into the room, the disciples had already been arguing and fussing and fighting over how good they're going to be. Like, who was going to be the greatest? Who, who was going to be uh, the, the most loved by Jesus? You know, who, who was going to have the best position and power when he became king? Jesus became king. They had this whole idea he was going to be an earthly king, and that wasn't even on the radar. Jesus had to, like, straighten them out. But here's what I think. <laughs> I think if I were Jesus, and I'm not, I'm far from it, but if I were Jesus, I would have maybe done what he did, bowing down and washing your feet just a little different. How many of you, let me say this, how many of you have ever seen Undercover Boss, a reality TV show from back in the day? You remember this, Undercover Boss? So this, these big CEO types would leave their executive mansion and executive suites and offices and where they would always get pampered. They would have everything done for them. Their car would be waiting with their driver. You know, the, the people at the Fortune 500 at the top, right, of the food chain, the one percenters, right? And so these guys on the show, they would then disguise them, and here are some of the, descript the, 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 the disguises that they had. They would go into a makeup. They would look totally different than who they were so they wouldn't be recognized. And then they would go work with the people that they've, their company hired, usually in the lowest positions, and whether they were cleaning company or whatever it is, or truck drivers or whatever, and factory workers. Yeah, check this guy out. Isn't that crazy? And then they would work alongside of them learn some of the stories of their employees, learn the problems of the company, what the company wasn't doing for them. Then at the end of the show, it always turned out normally really good, and they would bring them into the executive suite, these people they worked with, and they'd be right back to the CEO style, and all of a sudden they're like, hey, I was that guy that was with you. Check out the tape, roll the tape, you know? And the people would be blown away like, what? And they would usually say, listen, I'm going to give you a $5,000 bonus. You work so hard. And I know you got a kid trying to get to college. I'm going to pay for a scholarship fund for your childhood. It was usually like, what? So I'm just saying, if I were Jesus, <laughs> this is 2,000 years before the reality show came, but Jesus knows everything. He should have known that, right? That if I were Jesus, I would have gone into a whole different disguise and walked into the room of all the disciples as the lowly servant guy unrecognizable to the rest of the disciples and had the cloth going around there, the towel, come in, bow down, start, go ahead and take care of all their feet. And you know what? 
the disciples will go, oh man, the disgusting servant guy's here. You know, let him take care of my feet. Gross. Hey, get between the toes on that one right there. Yeah, clean that. And that's nasty. Got toe jam in this one. And look at that nail hanging off. Could you take care of that? I mean, and then, then when Jesus would be done, then all of a sudden, supernaturally, like Jesus could do because he's God, would just reveal himself and go, ta-da, I'm Jesus, your Messiah, your rabbi, your teacher, hey. And all of them would be totally humiliated. See, that's how I would have done it. But, but Jesus, that's not how he did it. So we're looking in the word of God where he, he goes on and says in chapter 13, look at verses 12 through 17. This is so key. This is the, the crux of this short passage. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, he returned to his place at the table, and he said, do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example so that you should do as I have done for you. Verily, truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you would be blessed if you do them. Wow. You know, Jesus just did that whole act of servanthood as an example. You know, also Jesus was baptized. He didn't need it, but he got baptized. Why? As an example for several of you that have been baptized at the church, and some of you, I can't wait to watch you tonight. We're staying for the big party, and we're going to have fun watching you get baptized. Jesus didn't need to be baptized. He did it as an example. Jesus didn't need to bow down to be a servant, but he did it as an example. He said, as I do this, you should do it for one another. He took an act, a less than act, and made it a more than command for all of us. Man, this is huge right here. Here's the thing. Where, where you might say, oh, wait a minute. I, I, I know where this Pastor Matt guy is going. He's in and out. He's going to start, in, 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 he's going to make sure that next Sunday we're going to have this big foot washing experience and there's going to be bowls up here and it's going to be all gross. And some of you are like, I got to go to the pedicure real quick before I come back to church next Sunday. Or some of you are like me, like, I'm not going to church next Sunday and let anybody touch my feet. That's disgusting, right? So, no, okay, time out. That's not going to happen, right, Pastor Nate? No, we're not going to do that. But I have been a part of a foot washing experience, and it's just as gross and disgusting as you can imagine, you know, especially when it's somebody you don't know, and they're doing your feet, and it's like, whoa, it's time out, stop, stop, stop. Here's the thing. Jesus did it as an example 2,000 years ago so that we could pick up our towel that looks a little different than it did 2,000 years ago. There are people here this morning that picked up a towel and washed your feet, and you didn't even know it. There were people that got up at six o'clock this morning, and they unlocked these doors. They picked up their towel, and they began to wash your feet by opening the doors, turning on the lights, setting the air conditioning just right so you wouldn't freeze and you wouldn't be burning up. And people got here early to make the coffee and process that whole cafe lobby area to make it so inviting. People got here early this morning and picked up their towel, and they went out into the parking lot. And on a hot day like this, they need a towel, right? To help them out. It's a little warm out there, right? But these guys got out there and they started parking you graciously, help, helping you, praying for you while you're parking. Man, they're picking up their towel. There are people weekly that pick up their towel and wash your feet. And they've been doing it all week as they've been studying the Word of God, preparing to teach your children in the Discovery Point Kid Zone. Isn't that amazing? And they've been, right now, they're back there washing your feet while they're loving on your children, teaching them the Word of God so you can be in here hearing the Word of God. Give it up for Discovery Point Kid Zone, people. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, that's the kind of foot washing that we are experiencing here at Life Point. We have been for 15 years. That's the kind of foot washing that we want to continue, that this is a church of more. Why? Because we want to touch the next generation for years to come, right? I mean, that, that's why we exist. That's why this church is here, to, to be gospel-centered, difference-making, community-engaging, multi-ethnic. You guys are on it trying to reach every young person. So what is the cost of... What is the cost of trying to reach every child, the next generation? It costs everything. It costs you something. It costs me something. 
Man, I loved even last week, Pastor Nate, I listened to his message. It was powerful. He sent it to me. And, and this, I want to quote your pastor from last Sunday. He said this, the church is not a resort that caters to your every need. It's not a social club. This is what Pastor Nate said. It's not an event that you attend, but rather, this is what the church is. I love how we defined it. The church is a place that you belong. It is a place that you develop. It is a place that you discover, and it is a place that you experience by engaging in the mission of what Jesus is doing through you to begin to realize all that you have been made for. Isn't that awesome? I love your pastor. Give it up for Pastor Nate, man. Yeah. Man, God wants all of us to engage in the vision by serving, by loving, by picking up a towel, by saying, okay, Lord, how can you use me? I may not have much, but I'll give whatever I can so that we can reach the next generation and be a church of more, not a church of less. So we say this at the churches that I've had the privilege to start and working with people, getting them involved in church and ministry and being fulfilled in their calling and their destiny. I say this, you have been saved to serve, not saved to sit, all right? You have been saved to serve, not saved to sit. Now, a lot of churches I, I, I work with, too, I always say, tell your neighbor that. Turn to your neighbor and tell them that, right? So help me out. Your practice is turn to your neighbor and say that right there. Turn to your neighbor and say, you have been saved to serve, not saved to sit. Turn and tell your other neighbor on the other side, you have been saved to serve, not saved to sit. Now, the next question should be, wait a minute, what are we doing sitting here? <laughs> that should be the next question, right? But here's the thing, man. We have a towel waiting for you. We have a towel waiting for you, even in our lobby, a physical towel just like this, so that you can say, I am crossing the line into servanthood. I am ready to pick up my towel. I'm ready to join these impact leaders. I'm ready to follow Jesus and, 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 and do what I can to offer myself, my giftings, my talent for kingdom work here at my local church. And man, I can't wait to see the impact you guys are going to make. Just last week, this blows me away. 84 of you said, yeah, I'm going to pick up a towel. 84 of you. What? What? So Pastor Nate challenged you last week, a goal of 100 over the whole month. You already got 84. I told Pastor Nate, you're making it easy on me. We only got to get, what, 26 more. We're done. We got 100. I think we will cross that today and more. In fact, we're ordering more towels for the rest of y'all. So join us, man. This mission is so fulfilling. Pastor Nate says all the time, I want you to be fully alive in your faith and in Jesus Christ. There's nothing more fulfilling when you begin to serve and give of yourself. There's nothing more fulfilling. In fact, I've seen people for 15 years here at LifePoint from the beginning days come, listen, sit, came to God at their own pace, took their time, had lots of questions, were skeptics, were not believers. And then finally, when they came on that journey of faith, they started serving. They found their ministry niche. They found their calling, their destiny. And I've seen people come fully alive. There's nothing better when you see people baptized into Christ, but what's even awesome, more awesome than that is when they do and then they find why they are made for more. Yeah. You are made for more. And that, it's so much fun to give back. So John chapter 3, verse 30. I'm about ready to finish. I want you to hear this, though. Jesus uh, said, said this. This is what John said. He wrote about Jesus. And he, John said this. He, Jesus, must become greater. I must become less. He must increase I must decrease. I know right now you're like, wait a minute, Matt. You just said that we're a church of more. We're made for more. I like the more thing. I'm going to get more. I'm going to do more. I'm going to be more. I'm going to for all for Jesus, right? That's cool. But wait, you just said that you must become less while he becomes more. So how's that dynamic work? So I got a couple volunteers to help explain that. Let's bring out the volunteers from the back. All right. Give it up for the volunteers. Yeah, we got two volunteers with two signs. And so we've been praying all week, who would hold the Jesus sign? Because you got to be a lot like Jesus. And so, of course, we, of course we picked a female, you know. <laughs> and so, uh, so, yes, so she's holding the Jesus sign. And then we had to find someone who really represents the selfish us, the rest of us. 
And so we found, we flew him all the way in from out of state to represent. We didn't want to pick one of you, you know, but so we picked him. So man, we love you, Graham. But ignore the people. They're holding the sign. The signs represent Jesus and this sign represents me, it represents you and our selfish self. So when our selfish self finally comes to realization that there's a God and I'm not it and I'm not him, there's a God who can forgive me and cleanse me and heal me and help me, then you finally go, okay, Jesus, I admit you're real, I need you, I need grace, I need forgiveness, I need restoration, I need help. When you finally get to that point of salvation, you cross that line of salvation, it's a, beautiful, it's a beautiful experience. There's nothing like it being saved, right? But here's the problem. A lot of times, once we get that behind us, we're like, all right, I got this. And you step out and go, hey, uh, look at me. I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm saved now. I'm all good. I got my ticket to heaven. I'm all good, right? Hey, this life's good. I'm not doing all the bad stuff, well, most of it, that I used to do before I came to Jesus. And look, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. And you begin to elevate yourself a little bit. You get almost a little religious pride, religious spirit going. You start thinking, I'm pretty good. I'm better than some of those other friends I used to hang out with and running and still doing things. Look at me, man. I'm, I'm a church boy now. I'm doing the right thing, right? And then all of a sudden you go, hey, and not only that, but man, I've been tithing, I've been giving. You begin to elevate yourself and you start telling people, hey, I, I went to the Dave Ramsey thing. I've been giving more, I'm doing more. And it's not become a testimony for Jesus, but you begin to elevate and self-promote. That's a dangerous place for any Christian. But I want you to know, we all struggle with some of this. Sometimes we, we do good things and we do servant acts and we even mow our neighbor's yard without telling them, but then we take a selfie doing it and then post it like, hey, I just mowed my neighbor's lawn. How cool am I, right? I'm a, I love Jesus. I'm serving everybody. But the thing is, when we get to this point, man, we begin to put ourselves away. And, we, and here's the question, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? Well, Jesus is still right back here where we left him. But then when we get to that place of brokenness where we say, even in our Christian journey, Lord, forgive me, we take a knee again. We get back to that place of repentance and asking for forgiveness. And then we stay where we're supposed to be and we decrease and Jesus increases. And we elevate Jesus as we, uh, we, we, we decrease. And so we get to this place, even this is where the towel and the basin come to play. This is where we begin to serve others and not serve ourselves and our selfishness. Does this make sense? And we get to that point that the less of us and more of him. Isn't that beautiful? And then when people see you, they don't see you so much. They see Jesus in you. And give it up for the volunteers. I hope that helps, man. Thank you, guys. Woo. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I really believe... I really believe that this church gets it. I really, I don't really have to preach much more on this because I think you all really, really get it. Some of you are getting it for the first time in your life and you are coming fully alive. God is using you to change the world. This is a made for more church. This is a church of more, 15 more ahead of us. Where's God gonna take us? During this series, the key scripture verse that Pastor Nate has preached last Sunday and we'll do it this Sunday and the next two is out of Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. And the Apostle Paul is giving some real solid encouragement to the church of more there in Ephesus. And listen to what he says. This is really, really awesome, really key. He says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more. Everybody say more. more. Can do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that it is at work within us. Notice pause in that verse, the word work within us. God is doing a work in you right now. He's asking you to do a work for him by serving others, by picking up the towel and ministering to other people. I really believe that. And notice that it's, he's talking to the church people. He's like, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. See, there's the next generation. What's it going to take? What's the cost of reaching the next generation? Every, it's going to take everything. Forever and ever, amen. Man, I'm so thrilled and excited about the next 15. This is a church of more. You need to be involved in this church of more, involved in the mission and the vision and giving and giving back. Because I really believe, Pastor Nate asked me to say, what, what do you think it's going to look like 15 years from now? Like the 30-year-old church, like what's that going to look like? 
And for me, you know what I see, honestly? I see thousands and thousands of children filling these halls weekly. I see thousands and thousands of children and teenagers being rescued from their own self and selfishness, listening to the word of God and learning the stories of who Jesus is, maybe for the first time. I see children loving to come here so much. They are reminding their parents on Saturday night that we gotta go to Life Point and Discovery Point Church tomorrow, mommy, daddy. I see that. I see children bringing parents to church and parents coming to know who Jesus is and trust him too. But I see your children's ministry exploding. I think you're gonna need a bigger space and place, right? Yeah, I, I think God's gonna do that too. Man, they're, they're, your leadership team's already praying about it, looking into it. What's expansion look like for this church? Man, what's it gonna, you know what that also means? It's gonna mean and demand for all of us to do more and give more and to be a church of generosity so that we can reach more people that may not know Jesus yet and by the thousands are moving to Fort Mill, South Carolina and to Southwest Charlotte. And they need to know that there's a grace place called Life Point right here, a destination place for their spiritual renewal so that they can find Jesus just like you did. What else do I see? Man, I see your church planning efforts, not just impacting thousands of cities throughout the United States as you're already engaging in helping church plants around the country, but also internationally. And I'm so proud to know that you all have adopted a church and started a church in Ecuador and South America. And that's a blessing. And you are rescuing children out of generational poverty. You're doing that. By your generosity, you are a part of that. Your hands and your prayers are all over that. You know what I see? I see thousands more children rescued out of poverty because of you, because of what the next 15 is going to look like. Man, I, I, I'm just blown away. I see a grace place. A place for broken, hurting people coming here for years to come to redeem and restore people that are in addictions and marriage struggles and relationship issues and depressive and suicidal tendencies, all those things, even the racial tension and other things going on in our culture, all the ills and all the things that Satan's trying to do to hurt us and bring us down. I believe this church will lead the way for healing and restoration in a lot of years to come. This is the place God wants to use. Amen. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you, join this church. Join the mission. Embrace the cause. Get involved. Get a towel. Let's do this. Let's serve. Let's do something immeasurably beyond what we can even ask or imagine. Let's fulfill Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. I want to pray for you. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. I'm going to get on my knees and pray for you this morning. God, Thank you so much for the mission and the calling that was birthed here at Life Point Church 15 years ago. And Lord, we celebrate all those 15 years to this day. And we look back and we smile because you're smiling upon our history. God, you know, we, we have, we've been through it, God. We know, God, that we've, there's moments we didn't trust you, God. There's moments, God, that we, we were like, Lord, where are you? Help us, God. And, and Father, we look back and we celebrate your faithfulness, even when maybe we at times we were unfaithful. So God, you're a redeeming, grace-giving God, and we celebrate the 15. But God, we need you even more going forward. So Lord, help us to be prayerful, praying audacious, audacious prayers, praying big prayers, as you are a big God. So Lord, I pray that you will do a great work individually in every man, woman, and child in this room listening to my voice, God, that you would begin healing, restoration, salvation. And that God, you would do a work collectively through this church we call Life Point. This church we love and admire of what your spirit is doing and has done and has yet to do. God, we give this all to you as we dream forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.